We headed towards the office inside of the cave, almost completely silent the entire way. Hargill tried to make small talk, but I was preoccupied with my thoughts. I now had a chance, a way to close the immersing gap between me and Alsic. With the aid of the monster leader and the rest of the monsters, I wasn't alone in my fight. Looking around at my companions, I dismissed that thought. I had never been alone. My friends having brought me all this way, without their help, Alsic wouldn't have died the first time, and I am certain they would be necessary in this new fight. We entered the cave, and after the monster leader gave a few instructions to a couple of monsters, we went to a smaller room with a desk and a few shelves, most of them filled with files. We sat in a few foldable chairs, and the old man pulled out a few papers he had placed in his desk. The core of the plan was simple. Tomorrow would be the big battle, where the monsters and the players would fight each other. However, unlike previous battles, the monsters this time would not be necessarily evil, and the players would have a choice between siding with and protecting Ulsic, or joining the Stonewell Knights in the Shesnix. House Cerberus would be leading these forces, and accepting any defecting players under its banner. This was to be done carefully and relatively quiet, so that Ulsic wouldn't hear anything but the vaguest of rumours. The players would have to be carefully chosen and inducted, and it would be us and the Stonewell Knights who would be recruiting. Placing myself in the players' shoes, I wondered just how many would side with the monsters. Even though it was obvious to us that Ulsic was the villain, the standard, the town is good, the monsters are evil, set up was something that would be difficult to upturn. Most would probably see it as a betrayal of the town, especially considering that Ulsic had recently saved it. Considering our goal for a moment, I asked if our in-game reason for this battle would be simply to dispose of Ulsic. It seemed heavily targeted, and it didn't really seem like justice was on our side. Since the Lich Ulsic's only crime so far was attacking High Cerberus, making it almost a private dispute, the monster leader handed me a stack of papers, along with a LARP's rulebook. Glancing at the papers, I realised he had just handed me Ulsic's character stats, including two pages detailing his lichhood. He then said that despite what Ulsic might have told everyone, there was no such thing as a good lich within this LARP. The phylactery he had was an immensely evil object that needed the lives of six people each month to keep it operating. He had used the phylactery to permanently kill the members of House Cerberus, without even explaining what had occurred to them. If the rest of the players realised what kind of lengths this man was willing to go to just to stay alive, they understand the depth of his evil. He then told me to start raiding. I had to study Ulsic's abilities and find a strategy that wouldn't require defeating him when he had run out of spells. As long as he had his seven bodyguards, it would take an incredible number of monsters to even force him to cast any spells at all. I passed pages to Hargill and Lith after I finished reading them, their eyes bulging with surprise. This was an enemy who could take on an army all by himself, with over 500 hit points, instant kill spells, a few area attacks, and a number of resistances and immunities including immunity to non-magical weapons he obtained through his lichhood. He could have fought the army of Shesnicks without breaking a sweat. Harjo seemed almost furious, his own character being nothing more than a substantially weaker version of this one. While their character levels weren't too far apart, the items Ulsic had and the rituals he had performed on himself made him far stronger than Harjo would probably ever be. With the number of times he could cast spells nearly doubled thanks to becoming a lich, Ulsic seemed immortal. Worse still, he was actually immortal as long as his phylactery remained intact. While I cross-checked things with the rulebook, the monster leader handed me more pages, taken from a binder intended only for plot masters. These pages described liches in great detail, and I skimmed through the details, looking for a weakness. The lich was perhaps one of the strongest monsters in the game, even if Ulsic, already the strongest player in the game, had not been the one transformed, we would have had a terrible time trying to fight one. The thing that made liches truly scary was that they had the power to kill anyone permanently by absorbing their souls into the lich's phylactery, regardless of how many times they had died before. And if the lich was defeated, someone simply had to absorb one person's soul with the phylactery in order to restore the lich to full health. The phylactery couldn't be destroyed by normal means, but needed to receive 10 points of fire damage, 10 points of lightning damage, 
10 points of ice damage and healed for 10 points of damage, which meant only a concerted effort could destroy it, which there was a very few people who knew all four of these types of magic. I started to think, would Ulsic even be willing to take the phylactery into battle with him? Or would he leave it somewhere safe? I posed this question to the rest of the group, but the monster leader simply shook his head, replying that he didn't even know what the phylactery was. After the monster leader left to take care of some business, the rest of us stayed in that small room for a few hours, with Vlian occasionally stopping in to discuss ideas. Hargel and Lith eventually left to bring back some food from the inn, leaving me to bounce ideas around with Selina. She seemed to agree with most of my ideas, but was rather quick to remind me of details I had forgotten that would be problematic. I seemed to have a habit of forgetting that there was plenty of other high-level players, most who would remain on all six side. In truth, I personally wasn't too worried about fighting them, but the rest of the people in our army had to be taken into consideration. While I tried to figure out a way to determine how exactly I could get a chance to defeat all six squad of seven without having to deal with all six casting spells at the same time, Harjo came bursting into the room, without any food and looking rather distressed. I immediately regretted thinking that they would be fine on just a short trip from the cave to the inn. Saying that he would explain on the way, he motioned for me to follow. Selena looked confused, but I was already running after Harjo before I remembered that this was probably part of one of his bad decisions. He and Lith had been ambushed, he explained, and Lith had stayed behind to make sure Harjo could escape to get help. I slowed down slightly, realising that Hargel had thought it was wise to just get me, rather than staying to help Lith escape. If Lith was even alive when we reached him, I'd be surprised. Lith managed to impress me. He was standing across from two men, one who I recognised immediately by his black leather scale and his two-handed sword. The other one took a moment, but I recalled the dull red cape that he wore on his right shoulder a look of intense interest appearing on his face when he saw Hargel and I. Each step the two took forward, Lith took a step back, keeping his distance warily, while clearly biding for time. Hargel moved in behind him and began tossing spells. The change in atmosphere was immediate. Our two foes shot forward, each to either side of Lith, aiming for Hargel. Lith managed to intercept the one with a cape, who had not yet produced a weapon, forcing him backwards. The other managed to get past Lith, his sword thrusted towards Hargel. I could get this. I was faster than I was last night. I had reawakened. I was stronger. I knew I could throw my sword out to block his attack from hitting Hargel, and I rushed forward to do so. As if swatting an irritating fly, he threw aside my blade with his own, continuing to blow directly into Hargel and sinking in another 8 damage. He would have hit him again if Lith hasn't turned around to strike him forcing him to dodge to the side and away from Hargel. Lith paid for this dearly, as there was a slight movement from the other foe's cape, and he dealt seven damage to Lith before he had even a chance to see his weapon. My sword in front of me, as steady as I could manage it, I saw two options. The first was brave, but more importantly, something I wanted to do, to simply get past these doubts that was invading my thoughts. These two were excellent fighters. I knew this well and these two would probably be our toughest opponents tomorrow. Defeating them now would mean settling my score, and we possibly would have a chance to steal their items, making them far weaker while making us that much stronger. We could prove that their skills had weaknesses and limitations, and that even a level 1 character like myself had a chance against them. This option began to seem less and less likely. Soon I would begin to wonder if we even still had the option to escape. The black-scaled warrior kept rushing past Lith, moving in towards Hargel while trying to keep the mage between the two of us. Hargel was taking blows left and right, and the red-caped enemy was striking at Lith with what looked like a two-foot short sword, parrying and striking while his cape concealed his movements. With a dramatic spin of his cape that blocked all vision, his short sword flashed out from behind it, striking Lith squarely in his exposed hip for the final strike. Lith dropped to his knees, and our two enemies moved menacingly towards Hargel. Hargel kept casting spells, but these two dodged the beanbags almost too easily. If they got within close range, Hargel could hit them, but they could easily finish him off before he even had a chance to cast a single spell. 
I move forward to protect Harjal, but the two move to circle me on either side, intending to finish me off last. If only I had a way that Harjal could hit them with his spit. Moving my hand into my pocket as discreetly as I could manage, I pulled out a beanbag, my one true advantage over these two warriors. As they suddenly rushed forward trying to pass me, I let them, then quickly cast an ice spell at the man's red cape. He continued to move forward a little, unsure of what had happened, before realising what I had just done. His feet pinned to the floor, I moved to strike at his exposed back. His allies stepped in to protect him, sweeping his sword towards me, forcing me back. A spell came flying towards him, and he jumped away before a second one hit his impeded friend. Time was running out. My ice spell only lasted 30 seconds, and a few of those precious seconds passed as the warrior raced towards Hargel. My memory of spells returning rapidly, I rushed towards Lith, taking the chance to use my last healing spell of the day to get him to stand. The black scale clad warrior had nearly reached Hargel. When I started calling out damage loudly, not even near his ally, he turned, and as he did, I simply shouted at Hargel to run. There was a moment where I saw the warrior think. I knew the dilemma that was going through his head, whether to chase after Hargel or to protect his ally. With a slightly defeated look, he moved to position himself between us and the red-caped man. With only seconds before the ice spell wore off, and Lith having barely any HP, we ran, splitting off in separate directions. When I arrived back at the cave, Hargel and Selina were waiting, looking relieved when they saw me. Minutes later, Lith arrived, breathing heavily but looking rather pleased with himself. To my eternal gratitude, Vlain appeared around 10 minutes later, carrying several sandwiches he had taken from the inn, having gone there after Hargel had told him what had happened. Eating while thinking, I realised that in the months between the two events I went to, I hadn't practised using my spells with my sword work. Had I practised, perhaps the last battle would have started and ended differently, without us having to run. Now, being able to attack and block with one arm, there was no reason for me not to use my spells more often. Ignoring that most people would probably chalk up the last battle as a defeat, I chose instead to focus on asking Vlain what he had been up to in the last few hours. He had asked the old members of House Cerberus if they were willing to side with the monsters. They had done so somewhat subtly, asking in his wizard NPC guise and referring to the situation hypothetically. Sadly, none of them seemed even the slightest bit interested for their characters having anything to do against Ulsic, having been at the receiving end of his rage once already. There was just no point, they reasoned, in being one of the few players who sided with the monsters, since the minority would surely lose for the sake of the game. Though I wasn't surprised, I was still disappointed. Without the old members, House Cerberus consisted of two members and two honorary members. With over a hundred players and only around half of that number of monsters, we were definitely the minority in the public opinion. These numbers wouldn't matter too much in the battle, since the monsters would have several respawns to represent more monsters, but public opinion wasn't something that could be ignored at a LARP. In a place that only exists within people's minds, the only way something could happen is if you convinced them it happened. If the monsters were too strong or respawned too many times, the players would protest and the events could be retconned simply to appease them. Things had to be done with discretion and skill on so many different levels that I began to wonder if it could be done at all. We needed more players to side with us, even if it was only a handful. Even if Ulsic started to take us as a serious threat, we needed more people to simply agree that Ulsic needed to die. While Vlain and some of the other monsters had helped us greatly, it was time for me to take matters into my own hands. Right now, we were pretty safe within the cave, as far as the game was concerned. The monsters had accepted us as their leaders, so our characters were fine inside the cave where they all had gathered. However, outside of the cave was Ulsic's squad and the network that supported them, which had managed to catch Lith and Hargel rather quickly. Worse still, with the majority of my plans relying on talking to other players, I would be basically walking into places where there were almost certainly would be some of Ulsic's supporters. And though the monsters had come to learn that I had some ability, the players would still look at me as a person who had only been to this LARP once before. The worst part was that my character didn't have all the information I did. 
Though the monster leader had explained that the Stonewall Knights had provided my character with information, there were still gaps in the details that turned into holes in my story. With a sudden flash of thought, the basis of a plan started to form in my head. I needed to convince people that Ulsic really was evil, and I was going to do it in probably the most evil way I could imagine. My sword strapped to my back, I told Selina that I was going out. She stared at me for a brief moment, and seemed to realise that I didn't want anyone to come with me. She nodded, and I slipped out of the cave with neither Hargel nor Lith noticing. I walked casually towards the inn, taking the main roads. There were several people who spotted me, running off to report to their masters. When I reached the inn, there were two members of Ulsic's squad waiting for me. These two were not part of the four that were considered exceptional, but neither looked like they would be easy in a fight. There were a few people outside of the inn, and this number quickly increased as the two squad members took out their weapons and silently began moving towards me. I didn't change my stride. They looked confused, perhaps wondering why I hadn't drawn my sword or even acknowledged them. I kept walking, until I was in range of their spears. With a genuine look of amusement, I started to walk around them, heading for the inside of the inn. The two moved to block me, brandishing their spears and asking me what I was doing. Now before I try and convince you otherwise, I'm not that great of an actor. Thankfully I knew this very well, and only bothered to try acting when I knew only the most sarcastic, obviously fake theatrics would be the best choice of action. With a look of surprise that deserved perhaps an Oscar or two, I asked what they wanted from me, as I did not even know who they were, or what I had done to offend them. Perhaps they were in awe by my acting ability, but it was more likely that they had never considered their character's motivations. My acting, as bad as it was, at least forced them to recognise that I was in character, and that they had no in-character reasons to attack me. After a moment, one replied that I was from House Cerberus, and that they had been ordered to destroy everyone from that house. Smiling, I first said that I was not part of that house. I was only an honorary member after all. And I asked them who had told them that I was. The other players had gathered around us, waiting to see if the three of us would start fighting. The two of them seemed stuck, slowly realising just how little their characters knew about me. Despite that their friends had probably already told them plenty of information out of game. The one who had spoken before said that I had killed Promes, and my confused expression was genuine. He described the shield bash happy warrior and I smiled before putting a hand over my mouth. I simply said that that had been when I was playing a monster and I was so sorry about any confusion. I then lowered my hand and I said I had never killed someone like that. He tried again, saying that I had killed Promes again this morning, placing my hand over my mouth again. I said that that had been when he had been playing a monster and even so, that had occurred during a quest which they shouldn't know. Removing my hand again, I gave a theatric look of surprise before replying that I had no idea what he was talking about. The two seemed to be trying hard to think, and I simply pointed to the inn, asking if I could go in yet. The other players seemed to be starting to lose interest, with many of them moving back inside. With disgruntled expressions, they lowered their spears, and I asked them to join me in a drink. Corpus, the one who had spoken, and Tyburn, the one who had remained silent, surprisingly accepted my offer and we headed towards the bar. After purchasing ginger ales for all three of us, using real money along with the LARP coins, I began to ask them pointless questions, simply things that would let them talk about their characters. At first it was obvious that they hadn't done any role playing at all since they had joined this LARP, but after they managed to overcome the initial awkwardness, they seemed to begin enjoying themselves. Tyburn in particular seemed to enjoy talking about his character, explaining that he hoped to earn enough gold to be able to retire young and return to the countryside and marry his childhood sweetheart. Part of me now hoped he would die miserably, but I didn't say a word. While I listened, feigning interest, I tried to come up with an excuse to leave them and talk to the rest of the people at the inn. Then my chance came to me as she walked inside and gave a loud screech of anger. A short, overweight woman who was dressed as a warrior was pointing her finger at me, shouting at Corpus and Tiburon to kill me. The two of them stood up quickly, grabbing their spears but not pointing them at me just yet. I struggled to think, trying to figure out how to handle this sudden occurrence. Taking a sip from my ginger ale, 
as casually as I could, I waved at her, asking her for her name. This woman, who believed that I had one time been responsible for her previous character's death and had gotten Ulsic to incarcerate me as a criminal, seemed to hold a very strong grudge against me, but lacked any finesse in hiding it. She stomped towards me, screaming at everyone to help kill me. Her grudge was nothing compared to mine, hiding it stressed in my restraint, but I kept smiling, pleasantly. The last time I had been with her in the same room, she had shrieked and yelled that I was a murdering card, and all I could do was watch, uncertain what to do as it had been my first event, and I had thought she had been my ally. Now, I wasn't going to just allow her to make the same event repeat themselves. Calmly, I asked who she was, and what I had done to offend her. She kept shouting for a moment, until my words managed to penetrate her rather thick skull. She paused, glanced around to see if any of the other players were coming to help her, then said that I was one of the criminals from House Cerberus. I asked her why she thought I was in House Cerberus, when I didn't belong to any noble house at all. Before she could answer, I interrupted her, and asked what House Cerberus even done to become criminals. Many of the other players were listening, interested in the miniature drama that was unfolding. With a wicked grin, the fat woman said that House Cerberus had killed the Archduke Ulsic, an assassination which was the highest crime that could be committed. I asked her what evidence she had, and she scoffed, saying that Ulsic himself had told her who his killers were. I laughed. There was no mirth, just an expression of how ridiculous I thought her answer was. Even the people who had still managed to refrain from paying any attention suddenly turned towards us. I was glad that I would not need to act, as my genuine hatred was all that I needed. I told her that Ulsic had lied. She looked at me furiously, as if that could ever be the case, and I interrupted her before she started screaming again. I asked her what evidence she had used to condemn and murder an entire noble house beyond the words of a foul, scheming, murderous lich. She said that Ulsic's words was more than enough. Attempting to divert the argument, she said that I had obstructed justice by preventing the capture of the last remaining members of House Cerberus only a little while ago. That I had frozen and tried to kill Rubido, who I assumed was the red-caped warrior, allowing the criminals Lith and Hargel to escape. Neither of us were role-playing, genuinely impressed by her stupidity. I asked once again, who other than a lich had called for the capture? By what right did any of the lich's dogs have to murder anyone? Pointing her finger at me, she started to shout, as loud as she could, that I was the murderer, that I had murdered her. I stood up. Corpus and Tiburon tensed up and pointed their spears at me, but I chose to ignore them. I moved forward, standing so that I towered over the woman. There was a hint of genuine fear in her eyes as if she was scared that I would strike her. Softly, I told her that that had been her other character and that I would advise her not to lose herself and try to remember who she was. Backing up to sit back down again, I calmly asked her to repeat herself. There was a moment of silence. The other players did not overhear what it was that I had said to her, but from her expression, it looked as if I had just threatened to kill her if she said another word. The moment stretched unnaturally before she said that the Archduke Ulsic was the saviour of this town and that his word was law. Unable to contain myself, I asked her who he had killed in order to par his phylactery. It was a mistake, I know, since that was information my character most likely would not know, something the Stonewall Knights couldn't have told him, but I didn't care. Her shocked expression made the people who didn't catch the significance of what I had just said at least realise I had said something very important. I asked her again. I told her that I knew that the phylactery needed six lives every month, and that Ulsic had permanently killed six members of House Cerberus at the last event, using the phylactery. I then asked who else he was planning on killing this month, since there were only two people in House Cerberus who hadn't either abandoned it or died. She didn't ask me how I knew. She simply stared at the crowd her silence telling everyone that what I had just said was true. She seemed to be working her mind as fast as she could, but the shock of me having just told everyone that Ulsic was a murderous fiend seemed to be collapsing any argument she tried to present. As if to rescue her, the door to the inn swung open, 
A brief blast of wind chilling the room slightly. First came Rubido, his red cape covering his shoulder and not at all looking surprised to see the scene in front of him. I knew that things were quickly turning against me, but I didn't understand just how bad things had become until I saw the man who had followed Rubido into the inn, the Lich Ulsic. His face painted white. He looked like some kind of terrifying clown. His robes the same bright colours as they had always been when he was alive. The fat woman retreated towards him, explaining as much as she could as quickly as she could. Ulsic's eyes widened at one point. Most likely when she told him I had just revealed the secret of the Lich's phylactery to everyone. He walked towards me almost ceremoniously, allowing the people between us to get out of his way. I hadn't planned on this. My original evil plan was just to find out where one of Ulsic's followers slept and then capture them during the night, forcing them to tell everyone in the inn the next morning all of Ulsic's plans and secrets. I had gone to the inn in order to make sure that I would have a chance to enter it and hold an audience. But now I realised this part of the plan was going to lead me to my death. Ulsic stopped a good distance away from where I was, before asking Corpus and Tiberin why they hadn't killed me. The two of them looked nervously at the two of us, but before either of them moved, I asked Ulsic how he dared to break the very laws of nature and still had the audacity to appear among the heroes who were patrons of this inn. Ulsic's eyes briefly flashed with the malice behind them, but he managed to restrain himself replying calmly that he was entitled to seek vengeance against the house that had killed him and destroyed his own noble house. This was not the time to laugh at him, and I struggled to keep myself from bursting, unable to hide my smile. I said that House Cerberus didn't even exist when he had died, that in his quest for vengeance, he had killed people who were almost completely unrelated to his death. I would have added that he managed to leave everyone who had participated in his death alive but I think Ossic managed to realise this on his own. The rest of the players surrounding us were no longer silent, muttering amongst themselves while Ossic glanced around at them. He then turned towards Rubido, as if about to order him to kill me, but he paused, abandoning any sense of strategy, any guile and any hesitation. He turned to me and asked what my plans were. The sheer boldness of this question caught me off guard. There was no reason to tell him anything and doing so could even be disastrous. I was about to simply say that he would find out soon enough, but I stopped. This was a man who I hated, a hatred that no good person should ever have. Even when surrounded by his cronies, alone and far from any sense of safety, being possibly the weakest character at the LARP while he was the strongest, I was more interested in providing him with a sense of panic than my safety or my success of my plans. Finishing my ginger ale, I stood up. I told him that House Cerberus would lead an army against him tomorrow. I waited for a response, waited to see his fear and panic, at the thought of having to face an army the very next day. He laughed. He laughed and laughed. The rest of the inn was completely silent, allowing his laughs to echo slightly. He looked at me with his tiny eyes, a grotesque smile widening his white face. I didn't bother to listen to his reply. Corpus and Tiberin were looking nervously at Ulsic, startled by his laughter, as was the rest of the crowd. Seeing a chance that might never come again, I rushed past Corpus, who was just as surprised as everyone else. I ran with everything I had, not the way I would have chosen to end that conversation, but it was certainly preferable to being killed. Without glancing behind me, I exited the inn just as I began to hear Ulsic angrily shouting commands. Before I reached the woods, I turned to see who was chasing after me. The entire inn seemed to have emptied out, but the only person who looked like he could manage to keep up with me was Rubido. Grimacing slightly, I leapt into the woods, hoping he wouldn't be able to navigate through them as fast as I could. He was good. Even as we left the rest of my pursuers far behind, he managed to maintain the distance between us, slowly closing the gap each time I checked to see if he had given up yet. He followed me for several minutes, until we were a good distance away from the inn. Understanding that he would never stop chasing me, I rushed into the clearing, whipping around and drawing my sword from my back. Rubido looked only too pleased. Both of us were breathing hard, and he slowed down as he neared the clearing, 
content that I didn't intend to run any further. There was a brief discussion. He thought it was important to say that he was very interested in fighting me one on one, and I thought it polite to say I was going to rob him of all of his gear after I killed him. He realised I wasn't much in the mood to talk, and launched his attack. He was good. He closed the distance between us instantly, his short sword flashing out from behind his cape. I blocked his attacks with my left arm, swinging at him with the sword in my right. He was too quick to be hit by my one-handed swing, but he backed up, looking not overly impressed. I moved towards him, sword in both hands, and trying to hit where I thought he was. My sword kept hitting nothing but cape, a frustrating feeling that made me wonder just how well he could read my movements. As a particularly half-hearted strike hit nothing but cape again, his sword shot out, stabbing me in the ribs for seven damage before I even realised I had been hit. Backing up, I realised that now wasn't the time to see who was the better warrior. As I passed him that title, I decided to see whose character suited them better. Nephim Festiva was not just a warrior, and I couldn't keep getting caught up in forgetting to use my spells. I think a part of me resisted them, not wanting to abuse the advantage of an alibi I had that my opponents lacked. Even so, I knew that I would have to rely on my spells if I expected to defeat Rubido. Throwing an ice spell at him, he barely managed to get his cape out of the way, knowing that it and his sword both counted as targets for my spells. He stared at me for a moment, a look of pure anger, asking silently how I could dare to spoil this battle between warriors by using magic. I replied by throwing another ice spell at him, hoping to pin his feet. If I could do just that, while there was no one else around us, I was certain to win, no matter how skilled he was. Easier said than done, he dodged the spell easily, then rushed forward, forcing me to block with my left hand. He seemed intent on preventing me from casting any spells, keeping close to me even as I managed a weak strike to his leg with my short sword for four points of damage. He didn't seem to care, intent on not giving me enough space to do anything but block with my left hand and swing weakly with my right. With only a little more space, I could swing my sword effectively, but he was matching my retreat with his advance perfectly. A second strike managed to get past my left arm, stabbing me in the chest painfully and dropping me to 4 HP. Only one hit away from death, I dropped my sword for the second time today, catching his short sword with my right hand after managing to block it with my left, flinging my left hand into my pockets as he struggled to free his sword from my right. I recited the incantation as fast as I could before slamming the beanbag into his chest. A payback blow for his last hit. I leapt back and was glad to see that he didn't follow. However, he was still smiling. My sword was still on the ground at his feet. In order to pick it up, I would have to come within range of a short sword where a single hit would kill me. I returned the smile, pulling out another beanbag and watching his smile disappear. With a gentle toss, I dealt him one point of fire damage. I then did it again, in the same way I had defeated Lith several months before, using two of the weakest spells from two different schools of magic. Several minutes passed before I managed to kill him with my fire spell, requiring me to renew the ice spell every 30 seconds. I worked quickly, because he had started to shout and yell, hoping to attract attention. No one came near us, perhaps actually scared by the intensifying panic in his voice. After dealing the last points of damage, he sat down, sulking, not wanting to see if there was any brave person heading his way. I told him that I was dragging his body, and he stood up, following behind me. After a good distance, I found a place with a good number of bushes surrounding us, and I told him to crouch down. I then said I was searching him for all his magical items, and that I would appreciate it if I didn't have to describe just how thoroughly I was doing so. He removed the plastic rings from his hand, then handed me cards, saying he had a magical helmet, armour, necklace, boots, and even his cape was magical. With great reluctance, he also offered his sword, a well-crafted weapon with ribbons signifying it was a plus two weapon. All of his items were extremely powerful, though all did nothing but increase his raw statistics. Even though we were both first level characters, his character was most likely a degree stronger than Lith was, who was a few levels higher. Or at least, his character had been stronger, I thought to myself as I pocketed the rings and the cards. I then took off the ribbons from his sword, somewhat disappointed 
in that the rules prevented me from tying them to my own, as his weapon was a short sword and mine was a two-hander. Even so, a plus two weapon could be sold for a nice bundle of gold, and I returned the actual physical weapon to Rubito. I then struggled with the question of killing him. I was past the point of healing with low-level magic, and I didn't even have any healing spare for him, but he still had a chance if he met a player with a strong healing magic within the next 10 minutes or so, before Rubito was dead. Certainly, he could be resurrected, as he was just a first level character, but it was both expensive and he would return weaker, being forced to give up skill points. Deciding to leave it to chance, I dragged his body to one of the main roads, his furious expression clearly signifying he didn't understand or appreciate the risk I was taking to try and keep him from dying. I began to shout, calling for help and a healer, until I spotted a person in the distance. Not even bothering to see who it was, I ran off, heading for the cave. When I arrived, Hargel and Lith were relaxing on the couches, talking about a movie they had seen recently. When they spotted me, they nodded a greeting, then returned to discussing the movie. Their nonchalant attitudes ruining the atmosphere I had hoped there would be when I entered the cave. Without an atmosphere, wrought with tension. I couldn't deliver my story of what had just happened with all the drama it deserved. Instead, I just told them I had stopped at the inn, a little pissed off that they didn't even care that I had left. Selina appeared from one of the small rooms, and I was guiltily glad to see a worried expression on her face. She asked me what had happened, and I began to tell her the whole story of what I had just gone through. As I told her, only then did I realise just how badly I had messed up. Besides telling Ulsic about the army, I had left him there in the inn, allowing him to get the last word to all the players who remained behind. Even right now, he was probably spinning lies and vilifying House Cerberus. Selina did not seem to pass judgement. She simply listened, sighing with relief when I managed to escape the inn and when I defeated Rubido. Looking over at the coaches, Hargel and Lith had stopped talking, looking at me with indecipherable expressions perhaps a mix of several emotions that no one had bothered to name yet. When I finished retelling what had happened, Lith stood up and simply said I was insane, though it wasn't clear if he was angry or happy or how exactly he thought I was insane. As an afterthought, he added that he didn't approve of how I fought against Rubito, but respected the fact that I had beaten him. In the end, he didn't seem certain of how to react. I think that none of us really knew what the repercussions of my actions would be though I had a very good suspicion that I would be regretting some of them tomorrow. Selina asked for further details of my conversation with Ulsic, and seemed rather glad that I hadn't given any details of the army. As far as Ulsic knew, she reasoned, I could have been trying to gather a couple of players together to fight him, and he still had no idea that there was a horde of monsters intent on killing him. Cheering up slightly, I took out the cards, rings and ribbons I had recently acquired, allowing my friends to examine them. They were rather amazed, as most of these items were better than even the ones Hargel had, and there was a lengthy discussion of who would get what. Once finished, I had received the boots cards and a ring, which increased my weapon damage by 2, so I dealt 6 damage with my two-handed sword, and my HP by 10, to a total of 28. By the time all this had finished, it was getting dark outside, and the cave started to get somewhat crowded thanks to many of the monsters being too tired to go out. While I looked over Ulsic's stats, cross-checking his abilities with the LARP rulebook, Vlian arrived, a wide grin on his face. He explained that he had arrived at the inn shortly after I started arguing with the fat woman, and had watched everything from within the crowd, wearing his old wizard costume. He then started to tell Hargel and Lith his version of my story, which he embellished liberally, saying things that I had fought my way out of the inn and I had called Ulsic a disgusting old shit rag. <laughs> <laughs> After I had finished fighting my way past all of Ulsic's men with my sword still strapped to my back, while shouting death to Ulsic, Flynn began to tell us what happened afterwards. As I expected, Ulsic had addressed the crowd, repeating his lies that he was a good lich, and that I had no proof of anything I had said. He then offered 30 gold pieces, a high amount in this LARP, to the person who brought me before him, dead or alive. Vlian had stayed in the inn after Ulsic had left, asking people for their opinions of what had just happened. 
Many of them remembered me from the event several months ago, with most of them having participated in the last attempt to capture me. None of them seemed interested in actively searching for me, some of them questioning Ulsik's motives, while the rest remembering how I had managed to evade capture last time, despite all our efforts. Some of the people were interested in joining together to fight against Ulsik, but none wanted to, unless a sizable number of other players did also. I had hoped that some players would be willing to take the initiative, but it wasn't surprising that they were still siding with what looked like the clear winner. Thanking Vlian for the info, I sank into one of the couches, trying to figure out what to do next. While my original plan for the evening had gone awry, I still hadn't turned out too bad. Though I had spent the day running and fighting, I felt like there was still more I could do, something that could help us in the battle tomorrow. Straining my brain, trying to force ideas into it, I tried to figure out how we could get more players to join our side. Going back to the inn now, with a bounty once again on my head, was probably not the best idea to go about it. Hargel and Lith weren't the best people to send out either, and Selena might also be listed as one of Ulsic's targets. She also had almost helped us too much already, despite her not being anything more than an honorary member of House Cerberus. While I welcomed her to help, I don't think being part of our group was particularly fun. She probably would be enjoying herself more at the Slarp if she hadn't decided to help us, but it was too late to ask if she regretted any of it. The best I could offer her in return for all her help was to make sure that Ulsic got what he deserved in the worst way possible. I allowed myself a little time to indulge in a few fantasies, many, but not all, involving Ulsic's death. While I wasted time daydreaming, I heard someone call my name, bringing me back to reality. The monster leader didn't look happy. Inside his office, he told me about the meeting he had just had with the other two plotmasters. Ulsic had said he had been hearing unpleasant rumours, and asked the monster leader if he had an army of monsters prepared for the sole purpose of killing him. When the monster leader asked where he'd heard this, Ulsic said that I had been the one to tell him. I began to explain that I had only said an army and had made no mention of monsters, but I realised those were trivial details. How Cerberus and I had provided enough evidence of what kind of army it would be, simply by staying inside the cave this entire time. And all Ulsig needed to confirm it was the little information I had chosen to give him. The monster leader didn't stop at his story to blame me, and continued telling me about the meeting. The other plot master, the man who reminded me of a lawn gnome, <laughs> didn't respond well after hearing this accusation, and the monster leader had been forced to think up something quickly. He said that he had been preparing an event that would allow the players to choose sides, either remaining with the town or joining with the monsters, in competition for a prize. The monster leader said that some monsters must have been spreading rumours about it, being an army to kill Ulsic because they knew he would remain with the town. Ulsic, the monster leader reported, had smiled at this explanation. He then said that it was a great idea, but that it was just a little unfair to the town side since they couldn't have any stats they wanted like the monsters could, and they also couldn't respawn. In order to make things fair, he reasoned, there should be restrictions placed on the monsters. Though the monster leader protested, he did it without enthusiasm, not wanting to present his hostility openly just yet. The gnome plotmaster agreed that this new kind of battle could be interesting, but that the monsters should have more restrictions than normal, so that he didn't seem like anyone had rigged the battle. While the monster leader had already limited the monster stats to keeping the players from complaining, Ulsic wanted further restrictions. Without saying it outright, he revealed that he had planned all this beforehand, reciting a number of restrictions that he wanted placed on the monsters. The monster leader, unable to argue very much without revealing his intentions, was forced to concede. He showed me the restrictions, and scanning through them, I saw that tomorrow was just about hopeless. The number and type of monsters that could be used tomorrow barely compared to what the players had available. By rough estimates, the monsters could only face about a quarter of the players and expect an even fight. Reading into details, I spotted an important problem. Among the restrictions, none of the monsters would be able to use lightning magic. I had been counting on this, since Hargel had plenty of fire damage spells and a few ice damage spells but we needed lightning and healing in order to destroy the phylactery. Without a way to deal lightning damage, we had no way of truly killing Ulsic. Without question, Ulsic had made that restriction solely for that purpose. I pointed this out to the monster leader, 
His eyes widened, suddenly remembering something. He pulled out three plastic rings from his pocket, the three unique rings we had found on the wolves we had defeated earlier today. He pointed to two of them, saying that they had already had effects that were decided upon and written down. The black ring set with a ruby granite is wear immunity to fire, while the black ring set with sapphire granite is wear immunity to ice spells. The final ring, a silver ring with three black bands, he explained could literally be anything he decided it to be, since he had not written it in the official treasure record. Thinking hard, I knew that it shouldn't be something too powerful, but we needed all the help we could get. Would it be a waste to make a ring to specifically handle our problem with destroying all six phylactery? Even if it would be, I couldn't think of any way for our side to deal lightning damage, and without that we simply had no chance. As if anticipating my next question, he agreed quickly after I asked, if a ring that allowed the word to turn spell or weapon damage into equal amount of lightning damage would be a fair item, and then handed me the three rings. As he did, he began to frown, having been reminded of something from the meeting. He simply said that there was an even bigger problem. In his haste to come up with an excuse for the battle, he hadn't really determined what prize they were going to fight over. The gnome plotmaster decided that he would determine what it was and keep it a secret from everyone else. He did say that even Alsic, who had many of the most powerful items in the game, would want this prize, and he said no more about it. This meant that if Ulsic won, he would end up more powerful than he had been before the battle, making future chances of killing him all but impossible. This was our one and only chance, and we would have to do it with our hands tied behind our back. Frustration surging through me, I asked if he had told anyone else about the new restrictions, but he said that he knew this information would demoralise the monsters. He said it was up to me if I told Lith and Hargel, but I saw no point. However, I felt obligated to at least tell Selina, to give her the chance to go back and side with the town instead of following us into a battle where we had almost no chance of winning. After I had finished talking with the monster leader, I sought her out in the main room. After asking her if we could speak privately, we stepped outside of the cabin. It took me a moment to gather my thoughts, to figure out exactly what I wanted to tell her. She kept looking at me, waiting for me to speak. I looked away in order to focus on what I had to say. Staring into the darkness around us, it took me a moment to realise it had gotten a lot colder after the sun had set, and that there was no reason for me to waste her time and keep her outside. As quickly as I could, I explained how our monster army had just been crippled, and that I thought she should make the choice of whether or not to return to the town. Looking at her, I saw that expression had changed dramatically. She looked furious, as if I had just said the worst thing I possibly could have. She began to yell at me, easily loud enough for everyone in the cave to hear. She asked me if she looked like the person who would abandon her friends just to keep her stupid character alive, and whether or not I thought she was stupid enough to ever be on the same side as Alsic. Then, as she reached a crescendo in her outburst, she asked me if I wanted her to go back to her ex-boyfriend. She paused, waiting for an answer while I stood paralysed. Shocked and scared, at an absolute loss of what to do, I stuttered that I didn't think she was stupid or that she ever abandoned her friends, and she interrupted me again, sounding even more furious. She said that I must have thought she didn't consider me or my friends as her friends. She followed that by saying that I probably didn't even consider her as a friend, because if I had, I would have emailed her at least once since my last event. She hesitated after saying this, her paws stretching out while she struggled to maintain a look of fury. As I watched her, I could see hints of sadness, but she kept scowling at me with conscious effort. I apologised for everything, for suggesting that she had the choice to change sides, for not emailing her once for not rushing to rescue her immediately during the large battle earlier that day, for being an insensitive jerk. I didn't offer any explanations or excuses. I simply waited, watching her reaction. Once again, I must have erred in some way. She turned away from me, said that she was still angry and that I should go back inside, hoping to avoid any more mistakes. I followed her advice, returning back into the cave, where a small crowd of people were looking at me as I entered. They all seemed to look away quickly, starting up conversations amongst themselves. 
and Hardzell and Lith were engaged in a rather lively conversation about the movie they were talking about earlier. The rest of the evening passed relatively uneventful. I spent most of my time discussing plans with the monster leader and a small group of experienced monsters, which included Vlain and Rand. Hardzell would occasionally drop into the conversation, but would leave almost immediately once he realised we were discussing how the units of monsters would be divided and how they would be organised. With any luck, Ulsic would not change the tired and true strategy of having the players organised by the noble houses, and any player not in a noble house temporarily conscripted into one. This gave us a decent idea how they would arrange themselves and what each unit would be composed of. Real military tactics had some value, but the way battles happened at LARP meant that improvised strategies, based on the rules and rooted in how things were perceived, were just as, or even more, important. Exchanging ideas, we settled on a plan that would not necessarily lead us to victory, but it would at least spare us from immediate defeat. What we needed to do was rely on the players' overconfidence which was based on the town never having lost against the monsters in the history of its existence. Ulsic and his grip were undoubtedly also discussing plans, and I knew that his advantage in knowing what the monster's limits were would not be wasted by his squad. While my ice and fire trick worked in one-on-one, I needed to come up with some way to fight the members of his squad in the middle of a large battle. Hoping to receive inspiration from Lith, I challenged him to some sparring outside of the cave, we ended up attracting a few monsters, who ended up joining in. While I tried to figure out some sort of strategy, nothing came to me, and when it had finally become late enough to go to sleep, I had nothing that I had any confidence would work. With Hargel, Lith and I borrowing bunks in the cave, we relied on our exhaustion to fall into an uneasy sleep.